Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a wintry, mon cold Monday afternoon of Chem 170 with your host, me, Dr. White. Now, if we had been face to face, notice I'm wearing red, and been, because today's St. Valentine's Day, I'd be handing out this. Actually, I usually do two of them, but you can't reach it, so sorry. Uh, you see what I do Halloween, candy too. By the way, I give out candy by my gold rule of candy. I don't give anybody candy that I don't really like. So you know, one of my favorites is, and this morning I had a face-to-face -face class at COD. They started face-to-face, -face, which I think is a mistake, but that's another story. And I handed out candy. All right. I'd like to apologize to all of you. I totally forgot, boom, that on last Wednesday, I promised that I would teach you my method to eliminate test anxiety. I'll be doing that in a couple of minutes, but I will cut it out of video, but feel free to come to my office hours or make special arrangements with me. I'll be more than happy to teach you if you're not here right now. In fact, one of your colleagues came by my office hour on Wednesday night or afternoon. All right, a couple of reminders. One, don't forget, you should have your signature. I think I'm just missing one sheet already uploaded uh, for to Blackboard. Don't forget, hand in labs. It's easy, 11 points. So please hand them in. Don't forget there's one due this Wednesday. Also this Wednesday, right after class, I will send out an email with the password for the password protected PDF file that sometime tomorrow afternoon I'll upload to uh, D2L so you can download it, so you can take the test. You'll have on Wednesday from right after class till 10 a.m. Thursday morning, take the test, take, uh, take about an hour or so, really should take you about 35, 40 minutes if you've been doing the practice problems in it, and then upload it as a single PDF file to D2L, and then I'll grade it, and I will mention this Wednesday, by Sunday, 1 p.m., I will have the grades posted in black for long school D2L. I will also to each person send out an individual email with how many points for each question you answer on the test. And next Monday, I will go through the whole test, all the answers. I always do even when we're face to face. Uh, however, I don't want those tests floating around answers, floating around the internet for all time. So I do cut that out of the video. But if you're not here, feel free to come to my office hour anytime. And I'll go over any test. All right. What I'd like to do first is teach you how to eliminate test things. Up. And as I say, it's February 14th, everybody turn off your webcam. And that's that. All right, let's go on with today's game plan. What I'm gonna to do today is next do my world famous review for next test. In this case, it's test number one. And then I'll go through the aromatic problem set. And then we'll finish up going back to alcohols which will be on test two, not test number one. All right, thumbs up people. Everybody see test number one review on your screen right now. Thank you, Vivian, everybody. All right, this, what you're seeing on the screen is available in the lecture folder of D2L secretly named test number one review. All right, let's do it. We've got test number one. You should know, what is a hydrocarbon? 
That's a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms. Again, everything you see here, and I just remember, if you cannot read cursive, let me know. I'm gonna to have to, if everybody has, I don't have to do it this semester, but I know my uh, lower level chemistry at COD last two semesters and this semester, majority of students cannot read cursive period, sad but true. Uh, you can also see it the way they sign their names, sad but true. All right, hydrocarbons, molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms saturated hydrocarbon. That's a hydrocarbon, meaning it's a molecule or molecules only carbon hydrogen atoms. It has only carbon carbon single bonds, saturated CH atoms and carb only carbon carbon single bonds. Now, unsaturated hydrocarbon is a molecule since the hydrocarbon with only carbon hydrogen atoms and at least one carbon-carbon double or triple bond. All right, now I'll never ask, and I put it down here, but I won't ask on test. Trust me, I wrote it, so I know if I did or not. Uh, alkanes are acyclic saturated hydrocarbons, cycloalkanes are cyclic. All right, you should know how to draw alkanes and cycloalkanes. Don't forget, one of your friends on test number one and two and three and four in the final are how many bonds to carbon? Four, four, one, two, three, four, four bonds to carbon, four. Yes, four. I can do it both at the same time, four. Am I good or am I good? Remember that. And I taught you how to draw molecules and we've been doing that. All right, next. IUPAC, and I'll never ask, and that means the official name, even though IUPAC, I like to say International Pure Applied Chemistry, I'll never ask that. And I showed you how to name things, the alkanes and cycloalkanes, and how to find the longest chain in a alkane, and how to determine how many carbons in a cycloalkane. With cycloalkane, every bend in a, carbon, a line is a carbon. Now, I asked you, or I suggested strongly, that you need to know the alkane names one through 10 and how many carbons there are in that molecule. Methane one, decane 10, pentane five, heptane seven, and so on. Next, I asked you to learn the alkyl groups. And CH3 attached something is methyl. CH3, CH2 is ethyl. For three carbons to the end carbon of three carbons and propyl to three carbons to the middle carbon bond to a ring or a chain is isopropyl. Now there are three possibilities, but I have never used or encountered one of the three of uh, butyl groups for carbons. So I'm not gonna teach it to you for over many decades. I've never used it. I know it, but I've never used it. And three, four carbons, the end carbon attached to a chain or a ring, and butyl, and four carbons, three attached to the center carbon, attached to a ring or a chain, is tert butyl, which I've already switched to T butyl. You can put either one on a test. And here's a mistake I haven't. Have any of you bought any gusoline? Spelling error, gasoline unless you know where I can get some gusoline. But anyways, where do you find alkanes? In gasoline, propane for your barbecue, natural gas is methane, Vaseline, baby oil. And I don't have down there, but there for the wax or candles. That reminds me, did any of you happen to drive by a gas station and think about alkanes that are in that product they're selling? Anybody happen? Oh, I see one person, but do any of you happen to use natural gas to cook, make something? I did a lot of cooking over the weekend to stock up my freezer. I have a huge freezer and did some cooking to add some things. I do bulk cooking, make a lot of one dish and freeze it individually. But anyways, do you think about natural gas was an alkane? 
How about if you saw baby oil or Vaseline? Remember, organic chemistry is all around you and it won't hurt to think about it outside my class. And I've got the whole semester to work on all of you. All right, the only reaction we talked about in that whole chapter that you should know, if you take an alkane or cycloalkane, react it with oxygen, you need a spark, but I don't put that down there, or a heat source, you will get carbon dioxide and water plus heat, but we're just asking for the molecules. And you should know how to apply that, which we did in chapter one problem set. Next chapter, I talked about the alkenes and alkynes. Alkene is a double bond and alkyne is a triple bond. And between the two carbons, the two lines show a double bond. And remember, you should know one of those bonds, double bonds is pi bond, the other is sigma bond. And you can break pi bonds like that, sigma bonds, you don't break that easy. All right, alkyne triple bond has two pi bonds and one sigma, and you should know that. Now, for alkenes, the IUPAC name, and if you go look, and I talked about this, but I'll remind you again, on test number one, and also two and three, there'll be nomenclature questions, and there are two main nomenclature questions. One is, here's the structure, give the IUPAC name. The other is, here's the name, which can be common or IUPAC, and draw the structure. And we did these practice problems. And for a double bond, this should be the whole A-N-E, not just the E. You drop the A-N, you name the part of the molecule, longest part, chain, with both carbons of the double bond, drop it as A-N-E, replace it with E-N-E, and use a number for a cyclic, meaning not in a ring. And plus, if you have two different atoms or two different groups on each carbon of the double bond, we use cis, meaning together, trans opposite. And let me just do a quick thing to help you out. And I would ask you, give the IUPAC name for the following, then I'll do it. I thought I'd share during the evening review. Give the IUPAC name for the following. Your turn. And when you're done, I better do the poll. Uh-oh, I'm doing something wrong. You guys are getting the hang of this. No, I'm not, I'm just kidding. All right, looks like everybody's done. Remember, when you're doing chemistry or nomenclature in this class, look for what's different. What's not a carbon, carbon, single bond or carbon or hydrogen atom, that's where the fun is. And here we have a double bond. How many carbons along this chain? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
only one chain. And so that's heptane. Drop the A and E ending, A heptane, replace it with E and E, double bond. What's the lead carbon closest to the end? And that's two. So it's two heptene. But now we have a hydrogen on each carbon of the double bond. And notice if I were to have a plane coming out, that dotted line, both hydrogens are below on the same side, and we call that cis. So this would be cis 2 heptene. And if they were opposite, it would be trans. And all the rest of the IUPAC rules for alkyl groups are valid. Now, in a ring, one you don't use numbers. One the carbon is always uh, one, the other is always two. Everybody knows that, and it's going to be cis. So there's no number for cyclic or cyclic alkenes, double bonds, and rings. Now, for a triple bond, drop the A and E ending, use Y and E in a number. You cannot have cis or trans for a triple bond. And as far as I know, I've only once long, long time ago. That I ever see a triple bond in a ring, it's not going to happen in this class. All right, next I started teaching you general reactions. And general reactions are the road block, a uh, roadmaps, roadblocks, roadmaps. I think my Freudian slip was showing. But anyways, uh, ooh, but to teach you how to predict products from starting materials or go the reverse way. And these are those you should know. This is not an open uh, Wednesday, an open note test. All right, the first one I showed you was take a double bond, react it with hydrogen and catalyst, the catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium, to break the pi bond, and each add a carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. And let me do this one to remind you about something. First of all, what's different? Double bond. Reacting it with hydrogen, H2, and nickel is a catalyst. Catalyst is something that makes the reaction go quicker, but is not consumed during the reaction. And a catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. In this case, you break the pi bond, each carbon gets a hydrogen. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this is your other friend on test one, test two, test three, test four, and the final is do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No, you don't, no. And therefore, I start with four carbons across. I have this methyl group, it's right there. And I broke the pi bond right here. Each carbon gets a hydrogen. That's what my general reaction teaches me. And I know there are four bonds to carbon, so I can put in the rest of the hydrogens. Remember, the math here is really tough. You got to know at this point how to add and subtract up to four and how to count up to 10. And know the numbers one through 10, which are smaller, which are larger. And that would be the answer. Notice I did not break any carbon carbon single bonds. Now, next general reaction double bond. X2 is halogen gas, where X is the halogens fluorine, chlorine, chromium, or iodine. You break the pi bond, each carbon of the double bond gets a halogen. Now, both of these were symmetrical addition. We're adding the same thing to each carbon. What happens when it's unsymmetrical? Case of a double bond with HX. 
one car, you break the pi bond, one carbon gets H, the other gets X, and it follows Markov the cost rule. And Markov the cost rule, and I'll never ask you what it is on a test, but I'll expect you to know how to use it. The carbon of the double bond with the most hydrogen gets the hydrogen, the other gets the halogen. And that's Markov the cost rule. Now for this reaction, X is chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Ooh, one thing I forgot to mention, listen carefully. On test one, and it'll be true for test two, three, four, and the final, I will never ever ask a question, what's the reaction product or products for this reaction? And the answer, no reaction, will never, ever, ever, ever be correct. If I ask you, and I'll get to your question in a second, Vivian. If I ask you, what's the product or products of this reaction? They're going to be product or products. It will never, ever be no reaction. Vivian, you had a question. Yes. Um, would you always want us to put the general, um, would you always want us to put the general reaction for every, uh, every reaction? Your audio broke up for a second. Okay. Would you always want us to put the general um, reaction? No. no. Listen, okay. Listen carefully. Some of my best students on the test underneath wrote the general reaction for each question where you have to give the product a product. Some of my best students I've ever had in Chem 170 never wrote that. That's up to you. I do it to help you learn it. Thank you. When I do it in real life, when I'm doing chemistry, I think I have a story right around here. So I may or sometimes I will write it down. Sometimes I just will close my eyes and visualize it. I don't know if I mentioned it, but I have a photographic memory. And sometimes some memories I like to get rid of and they still don't leave. Sad but true. All right, let's look at, take a quick look and remind you about Markov the cost rule. And here again, you do not have to put the general reaction, but I do look at a molecule, look for what's different. It's not a carbon carbon single bond and a carbon or hydrogen atoms should get your attention like that. Or like this, that gets your attention. That did. All right, double bond. What am I reacting with? HCl, that's a halogen. HX, remember for this reaction, halogens can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Break the pi bond. One carbon gets H, one carbon gets the halogen X, and it follows Markov the cost rule. And what is that? The carbon with the most hydrogens on the double bond gets the hydrogen, the other carbon gets the halogen. Or as I learned all long, long, very long time ago, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We're talking about hydrogens. This has two, this has one which is a larger number that you break carbon, carbon, single bonds. No, I broke the pi bond. This carbon gets the hydrogen because of Markov and cholesterol. The other gets the halogen. Halogen counts as one bond. So I know how to put the hydrogens in. Now, if you wanted to move this up and call that CH3, you can, you don't have to. And that's Markov and cholesterol. Now, you can also take a double bond and react it with acid. H plus is the organic chemist way of uh, showing any acid. Usually that's sulfuric. There's also other acids I will not be teaching in this class and water. And underneath, notice I have something for you to remember. Think of water as H and OH. 
break the pi bond, one carbon gets H, the other gets OH, and it follows Markovnikov's rule. The carbon double bond with the most hydrogen gets the hydrogen, the other carbon gets the OH hydroxyl group. Now, a triple bond has two pi bonds. And since organic chemists are lazy, and we are, instead of balancing, for my class, you never, ever, ever have to balance an equation. Organic chemists found a way around that. And that is for hydrogen in this case, you have the bracket X, letter X and the S, close bracket. And that stands for excess. That means you have as much hydrogen you'll ever need to react with anything hydrogen can react with, excess. And here the catalyst again is nickel, platinum, or palladium. There are two pi bonds. Therefore, each carbon of the triple bond gets two hydrogens. So you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. And the same thing is true with halogen halogenation, adding X2 halogen gas to a triple bond, two pi bonds. And here, X can be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Since you have two pi bonds, each time you break a pi bond react that carbons with the halogen, it gets a halogen, two pi bonds, each carbon gets two halogens. Next, I talked about aromatic compounds, and those are compounds that are very stable. I didn't ask you to learn the rule how to tell if a, arom a cyclic compound is aromatic, but I did ask you the simplest aromatic compound is benzene. And remember, this is the way to draw that. And everybody, heads up. In the lab, I say that to get everybody's attention. If I ask on a test, draw the structure of benzene, this is two examples. If you wrote this, this is cyclohexane, not benzene. I won't give you partial credit. And when we have reactions, make sure you include inside the double bonds or the delocalized pi bonds, which is shown by a circle. Because if you put this and it's supposed to be a benzene ring, I'll mark it wrong. That's cyclohexane. And I've had a couple of students lose 10, 12 points because they forgot to do that. And since that happened, boy, they were not happy campers. Trust me, they were upset. Woo. But ever since then, I keep on reminding students, make sure you put the bonds or the circle in benzene ring. Now, when you put a methyl group on a benzene ring, we call that toluene not methyl benzene. All right, now when we have di substitute, di means two, we have special names, we don't use numbers. And for one, two di substituted, that's called ortho. One, three, meta. One, four, para. Now at this point, I introduced some new substituents and chlorine is called chloro. Fluorine is called a fluoro group, Br, bromo, iodine, iodo, and also NO2, nitro, like a nitroglycerin. And we went through examples. Well, I'll do that later when we do go through the problem set for aromatic compounds. Now, if you take a ring, a benzene ring or aromatic ring, those double bonds make it very stable. And you're not gonna break those easily. They don't wanna be broken. So a lot of the chemistry with aromatic compounds, it's called electrophilic aromatic substitution, where you replace one of the hydrogens on the carbon of the benzene ring with something else. 
again, unlike a double bond, single double bond or ring, having those three conjugated alternated single double, single double, single double makes it very stable and doesn't want to give up that stability. So first reaction, take a benzene ring. And because of the stability, even this is needed a catalyst, take a halogen gas and fair trihalide. Here X historically has been chlorine or bromine. You replace the hydrogen with a halogen. Now, as I mentioned in class earlier, I will not, I will not be teaching you directors. Therefore, that limits me to what reactions I can put on a test for these next four reactions. And the only reaction I can give you for halogenation is this one where X is chlorine or bromine. Now, if you take benzene ring reacted with nitric acid, HNO3, and sulfuric acid, H2SO4, it's called nitration. I showed you how this forms uh, NO2 plus group called the nitronium ion. And that attacks and uh, bonds to the benzene ring and you put on an NO2. Remember that's NO2. You put NO3, I'll mark it wrong, zero points. Now, next, and that's the only reaction I can ask you that way because I'm not teaching you directors. Next, if you take a benzene ring, react it with sulfur trioxide and H2SO4, sulfuric acid catalyst, you'll form a sulfonic acid group, which I'm not asking you to know the name. I did teach you that, but that won't be on a test. And that's SO3H. You forget the H, I mark it wrong, because that's an important part of this functional group. And finally, I talked about Friedel Crafts alkylation. And here you take a benzene ring reacted with an alkyl halide. Our group is something with carbons and hydrogens and has a halogen of one of the carbons. X historically is chlorine or bromine. And you need aluminum trihalide catalyst. You put the R group, you do that special thing. You make a carbon carbon single bond. Now, if I look at the clock, it's time for our break. We'll come back. I'll give you one more example. Well, actually, we're going to do it in a problem set. So we'll cover it then. And that's the review. A uh, quick question before I let's take a break. I'm going to put up where it says, are you done or not? But please answer yes if you found the review helpful. No, if you didn't. Again, not this question, but if you found the review help. Well, it looks like for, by popular demand, everybody did. Thank you. And because of that, next test, I'll do that too. It'll be back by popular demand. With that, Let's take a break. Oh, I went a whole minute over. Come back at 156. I'm going to get up and stretch. I'll see you in five.
Time to get started. Everybody back? Well, I see one person's back. The rest of you, turn on your webcam, please. We're lost class. <laughs> All right, let's get going. Now, before I do the aromatic problem set, there are two things I want to talk about in the review that I didn't cover. One is on test number one, there'll be one synthesis problem. And I've done some of them in class, and that's where here's the product. You have to write the starting materials. And I only have one problem because they're not as easy as give the reaction product or products for this reaction. And it can be any one of the general reactions for the whole material on test number one, but there'll only be one. And just let me remind you, there'll be five, yes, five bonus points on this test. Now, the other thing I want to remind you is the following. I talked about it, but I figure I should do another one. And that is when you have two functional groups separated by more than one carbon. And let's look at the following reaction. Notice in this molecule, I have not one, but two functional groups, double bond here at the other end of double bond. And notice I have one, two, three, four, or three carbons separating them. Well, I think it's, I don't know how to count one day, but anyways, three carbons. And notice what am I reacting with? Chlorine, and look, I have, excess chlorine, all the chlorine in the world that anything chlorine can react with. So what functional group do I have? Double bond. What do I react it with? A halogen. Remember X here in this case can be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And you break the pi bond and each carbon gets a halogen. But wait, Dr. White, how come you have excess here, but not here? Well, this was for one double bond, but I have not one, but two. And being the lazy organic chemist, I don't want to have to balance it. So even though you've normally seen that for a triple bond, I can use it anytime I want. So do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, ooh, seven. So I'll have seven. Here are my two carbons of this double bond. These two carbons, general reaction tells me each one gets a halogen, chlorine. Look at this double bond, number two, which are these two carbons. I broke the pi bond because that's what my general reaction tells me. And each one of those gets a chlorine. And now I know there are four bonds to carbon. And remember, each halogen counts as one bond, and that's how you do it. Again, when you have a double or triple bond separated by more than one carbon, they react like they're alone. And nothing spectacular. Well, yes, it would be fun to do reactions like that. Now, when they're only separated by one carbon, interesting things happen, which I will not have time to cover in this class, because there are other reactions I want. Was well, so the two semester I would be, but it's not. Uh, 
All right. Thumbs up, people. Everybody see aromatic problems set on your screen. Thank you. All right. As I said on test number one, there are two types of nomenclature question. And the first type is give the IUPAC name for the following. And if you notice, methyl group on a benzene ring, toluene. Now, when you have methyl group on a benzene ring, the root name is toluene. Ooh, NO2, nitro. Notice they're one, two disubstituted. Even though the name toluene includes the methyl group on the benzene ring, that's still considered a substituent. Why they thought that, don't know, but they did. And notice the two substituents are one, two, and so that would be orthonitrotoluene. Now here we have a benzene ring, six-membered ring, three double bonds. I have an ethyl group and a isopropyl, and they're one, four, one, two, ortho, one, three, meta, one, four, para. Now I have down para, ethyl, isopropyl, benzene. If you had put down para, isopropyl, ethyl, benzene, I would mark it correct. Now, one of the hard things about organic chemistry tests, it's very hard to give partial credit. If you have the root name wrong, like in this case, benzene, you'll never get any partial credit. And here, if we look at when you have more than one group, you use numbers. And remember, die is two, tri is three. And for E, it's one, three, five, tri bromobenzene. Now, notice I have draw the condensed structure for the following IUPAC, and I also could be common name. And here, benzene. Remember, no circle or double bonds, three of them conjugated, alternate single, double, single, double, single, double. Then that cyclohexane, that'd be wrong. Now, I made a mistake when I had the order wrong. It should have been perichloroethylbenzene. How do you decode this? You start at the end and benzene ring, there it is. It's got an ethyl and chloro, doesn't matter which one you put on top. Para means four, one, two, three, four, and that's how you do it. And here I have metabromotoluene, toluene, methyl group. And I did something unusual, I put it over there. Most of you are gonna have the methyl group where the bromine is and the bromine where the methyl group is. Sorry about that. Did I tell you I have a Star Trek mind? My mind goes where no minds have gone before. No. All right. And I forgot to dye here. This should be one ethyl, two, three, dye and propyl. And my ethyl group is here going clockwise and propyl on three and on two. Oh, Dr. White got lazy. Let's look at A and B. A, you have a benzene ring, chlorine, ferrotrichloride. You get chlorobenzene. What I didn't do, and I'll do right now, to get unlazy. Is that a word I just made up? Unlazy. Here's the reaction. The general reaction is the following that I didn't write. Bad Dr. White. And you replace one of the hydrogens with a halogen. You also get HX, but I'm just interested in the organics, product or products. And that would be the answer. And the next one I have X is bromine. 
And these are the only two reactions I can ask you because I'm not doing directors in this class. Now I'm going to skip C and D, come back and E. I'm going to do F and G, and I'll come back to those others in a second. And here F, sulfur trioxide, sulfuric acid, you put on a sulfonic acid group. Where's the general reaction? Well, that is the general reaction and the reaction I could ask you. Next one, G, nitric acid, HNO3, and sulfuric acid, H2SO4, react with benzene to put on a NO2 nitro group. And how come there's no general reaction? Well, this is the general reaction too. And it's the only one I could ask you. Now, let's go back to C, D, and E. If I look at D, I have a benzene ring. What's different in CH3, CH2, Cl, carbon with a halogen, underneath aluminum trihalide, in this case, chloride, and that's friedel crafts alkylation. Benzene ring, alkyl halide, remember X here can be chlorine or bromine. Oh, I forgot to put that there, bad Dr. White. And aluminum trihalide. And here, this very special reaction, you make a carbon-carbon single bond from the benzene ring to the carbon with the halogen. And you lose HX, which we're not going to talk about in this reaction for this class. And here, the carbon is this carbon, and it's bond to the benzene ring. Now here, I got fancy on you. I have a benzene ring, ooh, carbon with a halogen. Do you break carbon-carbon single bonds? No. So you're still going to have a five-membered ring, but that's bonded to that. Ta-da! I'm done with the problem set. Any questions? Going once. Going twice. I guess not. So remember Wednesday, right after class, and Wednesday we'll have lecture and then our lab. It's a quick lab. Uh, normally I have this thing of right after, uh, right around the test number one. This is one of those labs I wish you were in lab with me at ECC, but you can do some of it at home alone. Yes, you can. All right. Let me close some things up. All right, I'm gonna go back to the chapter on alcohols. Remember, this will not be on test number one. It will be on, guess what? Test number two, which is coming down the road a little. It's coming, but not yet. And that was alcohols. Remember an alcohol, it's a carbon with a hydroxyl group. You drop, find the longest chain or cycloalkane, drop the E at the name of the alkane, cycloalkane, add OL, and for acyclic, you need a number, and for cyclic, meaning in a ring, no number, because that carbon with the hydrox group will always be number one. And the rest of the IUPAC rules for substituents follow as you've already learned. Talked about common names, ethyl alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, and tert-butyl, and you should know how to draw those. In case you forgot, ethyl alcohol.
which is also known as ethanol. Isopropyl alcohol. And that is the common name for 2-propanol, which nobody ever calls it that. I could also write it this way. And finally, T-butyl or tert-butyl alcohol, which nobody ever calls it 2-methyl-2-propanol. They call it T-butyl alcohol. And don't forget by tomorrow afternoon at the latest, hopefully by sometime this evening, I will post today's video of today's lecture and everything on YouTube. By the way, thank you for making me a YouTube, international YouTube star, I wish. <laughs> I talked about how benzene ring with a hydroxyl group is phenol. And we went through acidity, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen bonding, basicity of alcohols. And we're about to start the synthesis of alcohols. Now, just let me remind you, synthesis is a fancy word meaning to make. And this is the only reaction all semester that I can ask on two different tests. My test, not the final, my test, this one I talked about for that test will be on the test. Well, this one I talked for test number one, and it's also viable or important for this test. And that's, you take a double bond reactor with acid and water in the, uh, and you break the pi bond. One carbon gets H and the other gets OH from the alcohol and it follows Markov the cholesterol. And it's your turn. Give the organic product or products for the following reaction. Three points each. Oh, excuse me. I just yawned in case you missed it. Bye.
Let me relaunch this because one person isn't done yet, at least. I think everybody's done. So let's take a look at this. Oh, wait, I'll give you another 15.3 seconds. Go. All right, let's do this. What's different? What's not a carbon carbon single bond? Carbon hydrogen? Ooh, a double bond. Reacting with hydrogen, uh, acid catalyst, I'm sorry, and water. And remember, water is HOH. Break the pi bond. One carbon gets H, the other gets the hydrox group OH, and it follows Markov the cost rule. The carbon to double bond with the most hydrogens gets the hydrogen. The other carbon gets the hydroxyl group. Here's my double bond. That carbon has one, two, that has one. Hopefully, I'll agree two is greater than one. Do you break carbon, carbon single bonds? No. So I have one, two, three, four, five across. Over here, I have a methyl group. And here are my two carbons of the double bond. I broke the pi bond. This has two hydrogens, which is more than the other carbon. I'll get the hydroxyl uh, hydrogen. The other carbon will get the hydroxyl group. I know there are four bonds. Yes, four bonds to carbon. And that's the molecule you got. Ooh, let's have some fun. On test three, two and three, two. I think I have three synthesis problems. And there you go. Let me do one more thing. There we go. What would be the product starting material for that reaction? Three points each. Oh, that's a beautiful molecule. Thank you. You're welcome.
all right, I think everybody's done, so I better get to work. Now, if we look at this molecule we're trying to make, let's look what's different. What's not a carbon, carbon, single bond, or carbon or hydrogen atom? And we have a hydroxyl group. It's on a carbon. An adjacent carbon has a hydrogen. Why is this important? What are we reacting? Water and an acid catalyst. What do we react to get this type of molecule? A double bond. And notice one of the carbon, the carbon with the hydroxyl group is one of the carbons of the double bond. And adjacent one connected to this carbon is the other carbon double bond. Well, let's look at here. Here's the hydroxyl group. So this carbon has to be one of the carbons in double bond. Now, this carbon has a hydrogen. So if between these two, there is a double bond. You don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. So this is still there. And this compound will yield this compound. Now, let's look at something else. How many bonds to carbon are there? Four, never more than four, never less than four. Some of you might have written, and I'm going to do it in red because it's wrong. Why is this wrong? Let's look at this carbon right here. Everybody count bonds. One, two, three, four, five. No, you show me how to get five bonds to carbon and will be rich beyond my wildest dreams. That goes beyond having my own Lamborghini and Ferrari, my own island in the South Pacific, and my own fighter jet to play with. Goes beyond that. Why am I saying that? It does not happen. So remember, there's never five bonds to carbon, which is why this is wrong. All right. And since we've already done this in the last chapter, I'm going to move on. Now, let's talk about reactions of alcohols. And the first one I like to talk about is called dehydration. Dehydration means lose water. And you react an alcohol. And here you have sulfuric acid, H2SO4. This little triangle is like the tip of a flame of a Bunsen burner, means heat. And I put even a number. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't put a number like on a test. And what happens is you lose hydroxyl group from one carbon. And an adjacent carbon with a hydrogen, you lose H, H2O, water. And between those two carbons, you form a double bond. Now, it turns out there might be more than one side you can do that with. And another great Russian organic chemist, Zaysev, came up with the following rule. The major product in the intramolecular alcohol dehydration reaction is the alkene that has the greater number of alpha groups attached to the carbon in a double bond. Blah, 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 blah. What? What? Eh? Well, let me show you his ancestral. But before I do, everybody take a deep breath, let it out. 
take a deep breath, relax, let it out, are you all nice and relaxed? Of the semester, this is one of the two most challenging reactions, relax, you'll learn. What I'm gonna to do today is just go through one example because most of you have probably got your brain and mind zeroed in on test number one. And later on after test number one, we'll come back to this and you'll see how to master it. And let's look at the following reaction. I'll do this one later after test number one. We'll come back to this reaction. What do we have? Well, we have heat. That's what that triangle means. And sulfuric acid. What's different in the starting material? Hydrox group on a carbon. And so we have a alcohol. sulfuric acid and heat. And you form between the two carbons, Jason carbon, one with the hydroxyl, the other with the hydrogen, you lose water. And this, you never have to put down a reaction because I ask you the organic and water is inorganic. And this follows Zaysus rule. Years ago, I used to spend the next two minutes writing Zaysa's name and looking back, but I spell it right. So I got smart and said, I'll just put his initial, but I honor him for this great work. Now, what does this mean? On an adjacent carbon with the hydrox group, you need a hydrogen. So if I look here, I have two adjacent carbons with hydrogens, which I've cleverly labeled A and B. Am I clever or what? Don't answer that. Oh no, it's awful St. Valentine's humor day. So if I lose the hydrogen from A and the hydroxyl group between this carbon and A, I'll form a double bond. Do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No. So this would be A. If I lose the hydroxyl group and a hydrogen from B, then between these two carbons, I'll form a double bond. Now, which product do you get? Now, I've modified Zaysus rule to make it easier for you to do well on tests. Shh, don't give anybody, don't let anybody know that I'm being nice over my image around here. But what is Zaysus rule? Zaysus rule is you look at the number of carbon atoms directly bonded to the carbons of the double bond. You look at directly the carbon atoms directly bond to both carbons of the double bond. This one has one. This one has two. You don't count that carbon. You just count the carbon atoms directly bonded to the carbons of the double bond. I just noticed I missed the hydrogen. You guys should catch me on this. So which is the greater number, one or two? Is the math hard in this class or not? Not. And 
Therefore, this is our product. This is not. Now, in real life, you get 90% of B and a small 5, 10% of A. To make your life easier, whatever is the one favored by Zaces rule is the product you only get from our class. So let's go through this again. You have an alcohol, hydroxyl group on a carbon, and Jason hydrogen, sulfuric acid and heat. You have dehydration, carbon with the hydrox group and a carbon attached that with a hydrogen. You lose both, which is water, two H's and an O. And between those two carbons, you form a double bond and that follows Zaces rule. Zaces rule is, and this is important where students mess up. Don't, even though chemists mess up. You count the number of carbon atoms directly bonded to the carbon's double bond. Here in A, you don't count the CH3, just the CH2. That's one. In B, you have two of them. Therefore, B is the product. That's how you do Zaysa's rule. I said, this is a complex reaction. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I don't do cap and crunch in, in organic reactions. They still make cap and crunch. I'm, I'm not a cereal person. But anyways, I'm sure they do. I think I saw a couple months ago an ad for that on TV. But anyways, that's how you do Zaysa's rule. All right, let's do some easy ones. If you take an alcohol reacted with HX, and X can be chlorine, fluorine, uh, the chlorine bromure iodide, and I'll write this again, you replace the hydroxyl group with the halogen. Now, you'll see sometimes I'll write inorganic, like I have the HOH, which is otherwise known as water, because I had students who got all upset when I didn't do that, but on a test, I'm just asking, give the organic product or product. And the question would be, give the organic product or products for the following reaction, three points each. And what do you do? You look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond, carbon or hydro, ooh, a hydroxyl group on carbon, alcohol. Reacting with HX, remember that's the halogens. and you replace the hydroxyl group with the halogen on the carbon that had the hydroxyl group, which is this carbon right here. Do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No. So I started with four, I better end up with four. Which carbon had the hydroxyl group, that one? And what's the halogen X? That is for, uh, iodine. And there are four bonds to carbon, so I know how to put the hydrogens in. And there you go. And it's your turn to have some fun.
And what would be the product or products for following a reaction? Your turn. That looks better. Sorry about that. All right, I think everybody's done. And by the way, I pulled a trick on you. I put a big, scary molecule. And if you didn't know what to look for, it's big and scary. If you do, it's not. Look for what's different. What's not carbon or hydrogen hydroxyl group on a carbon alcohol. I'm reacting with HBr, HX. Remember, X is the halogens, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And you replace the hydroxyl group with a halogen on the carbon that has the hydroxyl group. Do you break carbon carbon single bonds? No. So I have one, two, three, four, five. I have this methyl group, this methyl group. This is a carbon with my hydroxyl group. I replace it on that carbon with a halogen, when in this case is bromine. I know there are four bonds to carbon. And that's the product you get. That's a BR. All right. How are we doing time wise? Doing good. It's time for a public service announcement from Dr. White. Actually, two of them. Don't forget, I have office hour tonight from 5 till 6 15. Now, the other thing I like to talk about, and this will never be on a test. I'll say that again, this will never be on test, but it's quite important, I think, to you. And that's BPA. How many of you have ever heard BPA? You see a product, this is BPA free. BPA is short for bisphenol A, which is a common name for the following alcohol. Actually, it's a dialcohol called dialcohol, diol. And here's the structure of BPA. You have a methyl group, or carbon, not a methyl group, with two methyl groups, benzene ring, and the pair position of each benzene ring is a hydroxyl group. And it's an important industrial intermediate. Now, one of the things this has been used for is certain stabilizers and certain plasticizers. And it used to be in baby bottles, it isn't anymore. Thanks to Walmart, one of the good things they did, they went to all their baby bottle suppliers and said, we won't buy from you. You still have BPA in it because the people were talking to get rid of BPA. 
Now, BPA is a molecule that organic chemists synthesize. It's found nowhere in nature. A couple of years ago, I saw a study where they measured from blood samples the level of BPA, or if there were any in Americans, and 90% of us had it in our blood. The reason I'm talking about it is BPA is a very bad, it's called endocrine disruptor. What it does is it fools your body to think it's a certain hormone, which it's not. And that causes the problems, especially among young children and pregnant women. And where do you get BPA? Well, it used to be in certain plastics. But the one I do want to talk about is how many of you have ever seen at a gas station, if you ask for a receipt, that paper comes out of the slot and that's called thermal paper. Or if you go to any supermarket and they give you a receipt, thermal paper, and those receipts have in the coating on the top of the paper, BPA. If you are pregnant, if you have little children, do not let them touch that paper. If you're pregnant, wear a glove, rubber, leather, whatever. And that stops because BPA gets on your skin and gets into your blood, which is not good if you, A, are a young kid, or B, if you're a pregnant woman, because that will cause serious harm to your fetus, your baby. So that's my public service announcement. If I look at the clock, it's time for a break. I'll see you in five. Come back at 2.50.
<laughs> Time to get going. All right. Oh, let's do another example of the reaction we just did. And there's another example for you to have some fun with. Am I nice or am I nice on St. Valentine's Day? You're doing organic chemistry. Hopefully it's not too painful or not painful at all. And while you're doing that, when you have a chance, you'll see in Blackboard, Blackboard Wrong School, D2L, if you've handed in lab number one, I've graded it and posted your score. Now, normally when we're face to face, I'd hand you back the lab and you see a red mark when something's wrong. Obviously I can't do this, but even if we were face to face, I'm gonna say the following. If you ever have a question about why I graded something the way I did, ask. When I say there's no such thing as a dumb question, that also includes anything I grade of yours. You can always ask me, why did, what was the reason I got that score? I'll be more than happy to show you. All right, let's do this. I think everybody's done. What's different in this molecule? What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Ooh, an oxygen with a hydrogen on a carbon? It's an alcohol reacting with. HCl, hydrochloric acid, HX, remember X is for the halogens. For this reaction, it's chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And you replace the hydroxyl group, OH, on the carbon it is with a halogen. In this case, do you break carbon, carbon single bonds? No. So I still have the methyl group on the ring. This is my carbon right here with the hydroxyl group, and I'll replace with the halogen, which is chlorine. It turns out sometimes you can get from Mother Nature, who's a great organic chemist, alcohols, and you make them into alcohol halides, Rx, which I'll teach you later in the semester, are fun to react. All right, kind of everybody's attention. Next thing I'm going to put on the whiteboard, do not, you do not have to copy this down. I want to show you a problem with the reaction. I just had you work. What if you had this molecule? and you wanted to replace this hydrox group with a chlorine. We'd say, oh, I know how to do that. I'll react it with HCl and I'll replace that with a chlorine. Oops. <laughs> but in real life, no. What do you mean no? Well, let's look at this molecule right here. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen atom? Well, if we look at that molecule, oh, look, I've got a double bond. I also have an alcohol. So let's look at those two functional groups. Well, alcohol, 
you just learn does this. Again, this you don't have to write down what I'm doing. And X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. But I have a double bond, and that will react with HX. And you break the pi bond, one carbon gets H, the other gets X, and it follows markov nikos rule. So this double bond can also react. So you could get this molecule where only double bond reacts, or you could get both react. Again, this you don't have to write down. And notice there are three possible products. And most likely, you're going to get an awful mess of all three of those, which isn't going to make your life easy if the only thing you want to make is this molecule right here. Well, it turns out this happens a lot in organic chemistry. So what do you do? Well, you find another reaction. In this case, someone invented, and for some reason, there's no name to it, and I don't know who came up with it, but I've used this reagent, this reaction, myself. And what is that that's using thionyl chloride? Thionyl chloride, and I'll never ask you what is thionyl chloride on a test, is SOCl2. Thionyl chloride will not, will not react with double bonds, but it will react with alcohols. And what you do is you take an alcohol, react it with a thionyl chloride, and the carbon with the hydrox group will now have a chlorine, just like HCl, but HCl will react with a double bond. This won't. And therefore, if I wanted to do the reaction, you get some SO2 and HCl, which you can neutralize. Oh, by the way, I should mention thionyl chloride is interesting stuff. If you work with it under normal conditions on a slightly humid day, it starts reacting with the water in the air to give off very dangerous white clouds of hydrochloric acid. So this is one of those chemicals that separates those who will become organic chemists from those who aren't going to be organic chemists. Yes, I've worked with it and I got my PhD. So you know a group I was I am in. All right, let me first show you with this. Uh, let's do a uh, if we were to react this with thionyl chloride. The double bond is unreacted and miscounted. This is all you would get. And that's the beauty of learning different organic chemical reactions. So let's look at for you people. An example. And I'll do this one, let you have some fun. And if we had this reaction, what would be the product or products? Well, I look at the first thing, what's different, what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, I've got an alcohol reacting with thionyl chloride. And you replace the hydrox group on that carbon with a halogen. Do you break carbon, carbon single bonds? No. Therefore, I have three carbons. 
this carbon had the hydroxyl, we'll now have the chlorine. And that's what you get. That inorganic stuff, and eh, it's inorganic. I'm an organic chemist. I'm doing reactions like this on paper. I don't care about that stuff. If you're doing the lab or in the plant, then you've got to figure out what do I do with all that and other things, but not in this class. And this is another way I could write that reaction. Alcohol reacting with SOCl2, thionyl chloride, and it's your turn. Give the organic product or products for the following. Well, it looks like everybody's done, so I better get to work. Well, what do we have that's different? What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Ooh, an oxygen with a hydrogen and a carbon? That's an alcohol. What am I reacting with? Thionyl chloride. What happens? You replace the hydroxyl group with a chlorine from thionyl chloride on the carbon that the hydrox group was on. So I have five carbons. Do I break any bonds there? No, you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. This carbon is this carbon. Replace the hydroxyl group with chlorine. And that's the product you get. Now in test three, test two, I mean, I'll have, I think usually three synthesis problems. So let's practice one. What would be the starting material that you react with thionyl chloride to make that molecule? This is the fun part of organic chemistry but I'm biased, I'm an organic, synthetic organic chemist. Oh, excuse me, got up too early today. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I've been up since about 4 a.m. If I had slept till five, I wouldn't be yawning now. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have to go anywhere tonight other than my office hour, which I will be there. All right, let's take a look at this. What's different? What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or a carbon or hydrogen atom? a chlorine on a carbon, alkyl halide. In this case, even more specifically, 
because the reagent and alkyl chloride. And what do you do to react with thionyl chloride? You react it with an alcohol. In this step, am I adding any carbons? No. So if I end up with a five carbon ring, I better start with a five carbon ring. The carbon with the halogen will be the carbon with the alcohol. And that's how you do it. All right, we've gotten to that point in this semester, I can start doing the following. I can ask the question, why are you learning this stuff? Good question. Well, the obvious answer is you want to get a good grade in this class because somebody said you have to take the class to get into either a school or a program. And by the way, I got some good news last night. One of my summer students, uh, he applied to graduate school for I forgot what, physician's assistant or some other similar to that at NIU. And students who get high B's and or A's in my class, plus who I've, or on Zoom, I get to meet you sometime during the semester and talk to you, just find out about you. I write letters of recommendation. For some reason, a lot of health-related schools, nursing schools, when they see a letter of recommendation from an organic chemist, they say, wow, this person must be good because you know how hard and difficult the organic chemistry is. Well, if you didn't take it with me, yes, but even if you did, you've done a great job. So anyways, well, really, why are you learning this stuff? And that's the question I can ask you to ask more and I can answer it. Well, let's look at the last two reactions. What did you learn how to do? Either one replaced the hydroxyl group with a halogen. Second one was always chlorine. And you're saying, so what does that mean? Well, let's take a look. All right, I think you're all familiar with, at least I assume you are, with artificial sweeteners. And for someone who's not skinny, right, that's an understatement if I've heard one, these sweeteners for a while, and I'll tell you why I don't later on, don't use them anymore, are used as sugar substitute because there's zero calories. In other words, you're not gonna gain weight. Now, one of the most popular, and I don't own any stock in this company, I'm being honest, is Splenda. Now, Splenda, the main ingredient that tells your tongue to tell your brain, mm, this is sweet, it's good, is sucralose, which is a common name. And sucralose has this structure. And I'll teach you about this, it's called a Hawthorne representation these each bend is a carbon and notice there's a halogen on a carbon here a halogen on a carbon here and a third one right here and this molecule tricks your body into thinking i'm sugar i taste sweet but it's not and it has no calories now why do they call the sucralose because it's made from sucrose. And sucrose has this structure, otherwise known as table sugar. Now, if you notice, you got all these hydroxyl groups here. And this one here, this one here, I think this one right here, if we go back to 
sucralose, what they did was replace the hydroxyl groups, OH groups, three of them, in table sugar, sucrose, with chlorines. How would they do that? One of the two reactions I just showed you. Which one? Well, it's a trade secret. How exactly, but that's what they're, they do. So the general reactions I am teaching you this semester are building blocks to allow people to make things that you use in your daily life. This is an example of one. Sucrose, table sugar, you know, stuff you can buy in bags. Years ago, it used to be five pound bags. Now to keep the price about the same, it's been that way for a couple of years, it's four pound bags. Unless it's on sale, recently I found out the cheapest place to buy uh, table sugar and I don't get any kickbacks from them, is Walmart. They're usually the cheapest around. I try and go into my local Walmart about max four or five times a year. Just that dangerous. I can drop $150 like that in a Walmart, just picking up stuff. And I did Friday. I got a lot of stuff I needed for the next couple of months. But anyways, so... By using the general reaction, either HX with an alcohol or thionyl chloride, I don't know which one, but the company that makes Splenda, they take regular sugar and react it, put a couple of chlorines on there and make Splenda. Now, what I'm about to tell you, is this a personal thing from Dr. White's personal life? Well, is there a public life? Yeah, now, but anyways, uh, twice in my life, and I don't do it anymore, I gave myself food poisoning by making my own um, kimchi, which was quite good, but sitting in my refrigerator, I didn't have the right whatever, and I gave myself food poisoning. And the first time I did that, it was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. I went to my doctor and he told me, you're doing the right things and you'll just get over it. You're not gonna die from it or anything like that. Good news, I didn't. And we're talking next time I went in, I said, you know something, or when I did go in, I said, I just read an article that was, I think the Wall Street Journal. And they talked about how these two gastroendocrinologists, I'm using the right term, doctors who specialize in your stomach and your intestines were both overweight decided to test something. And that was what fact did the artificial sweeteners they were eating, consuming in food and drinks up to then. At that time I was drinking, I don't drink as much pop, but I've switched over the last couple of years to water instead of pop, but Dr. White loves Dr. Pepper and I love Werner's. If you don't know what Werner's is, oh, are you missing something? It's a very spicy, highly carbonated ginger ale. You can get it at uh, Jewel, just in case you were wondering. Here's Werner's their standard can or bottle. I always have at least two cases in the house, always. Well, I used to be getting diet Verner's. So I talked to my doctor about it. And I said, you know, I read this article where these two doctors found by, uh, how should I do this politely? Analyzing their and about 20 of their friends poop after they ate stuff with artificial sweeteners in it for the flora or the colonies that are in your poop. And they found it killed most of them. You know how you can take certain things to build up your probiotics or colonies in your intestine and stomach. Now I'm beyond my level of knowledge of the human body. Those killed off a lot of it. And that made you hungrier and want to eat more. And the product was supposed to help you lose weight. And my doctor said, well, and he wasn't, he wasn't overweight at all. I wish I was his weight. I call him skinny. But anyways, 
Uh, it's not that skinny, but no, no weight problem. He says, whenever I chew gum or any other product with an artificial sweetener, it upsets my stomach, so I don't. So I decided no artificial sweeteners. And I had a couple of cases of pop, burners and all that. And I brought it to both ECC and uh, COD and put a sign free, take some, and it disappeared like that. But anyways, I started drinking uh, pop, which I've cut back down with sh regular sugar in it or high fructose corn syrup. I'll teach you about that later in the semester. And I was drinking a lot of tea. I still have a couple of tea, cups of tea during the day. And I was using equal artificial flavor also, or sugar that also wiped out your flora, your probiotics and your intestinal stomach region. And I went to sugar. Guess what? I started losing weight and I kept it off. I'm consuming sugar and it's not adding weight. And that's because I'm not killing off my probiotics or the flora, little creatures that live in your intestines and stomach to help you digest and consume food. That's my own personal thing. Question. So when you say artificial sweeteners, would that be the same with like a stevia as well? I don't know. You'd have to check. At that okay. time, the study, they only, I think, used equal-like products and Splenda. And I was shocked when I read that because it turns out in the story, both of these doctors were overweight. They were always fighting to try, how do I lose weight? And once they stopped taking those, they found it easier to lose weight because having those, uh, what's the right term, probiotics or flora, microbes in your intestines and stomach, well, helped you consume food better, more digest it, and it didn't make you as hungry or uh, have the need to, as a friend of mine used to say, you know, go grazing in your refrigerator. <laughs> for snacks and stuff, you know, like a cow grazing in a field. And I've been guilty of that too. Anyways, I don't remember the article, but I knew it was in the New York Times or Wall Street Journal a couple, of, a number of years ago, about 2015, 2017. If you want, I can look for it. But I think I had a one-time bookmark. All right, let's move on. Now, before I talk about the oxidation of alcohols, I need to teach you something. Not all alcohols are created equal. Now, the following will never be on a test, but I'll use the terminology in class so you should know about it. If you have one R group, on the carbon with the hydroxyl group. This is called a primary alcohol. And it's abbreviated by organic chemists like this. That's a primary alcohol. If you have two R groups and they can be the same or different, and I haven't used it yet, but I'm going to use R and R prime. Sometimes People use subscript letters or numbers, but when there are only a few R groups we use, this is called a prime. So this means this R group and this R group can be the same or different, just like in math, X, Y, and Z can be different. This can be, you have this type of arrangement, two R groups on the carbon with the hydroxyl group, we call that a secondary. alcohol. And again, switches off, but I will use these terms throughout the semester. And we abbreviate it like this. Two little superscript zero, secondary ROH alcohol. And now if you have three R groups on the carbon with the hydroxyl group, 
and they can be same or different. And notice I have our prime, one line, our double prime, two lines. Later on, I'll even do our three prime. Now in patents, usually you don't use that, use letters or subscript numbers or letters, because you can have a lot of different R groups. And this is called a tertiary. alcohol, three, tertiary, and it's abbreviated like this. So you have a primary alcohol, secondary alcohol, tertiary alcohol. I'll never ask that on a test, but I will use that terminology throughout the semester. So let's get back to oxidation of an alcohol. If you take a primary alcohol and oxidize it, you can get an aldehyde. And I will rewrite this a little, little differently. If you take a primary alcohol and oxidize it, now, if you notice above the arrow, I have a bracket, O close bracket. And this is the general way for indicating an oxidizing reagent. That comes from oxygen, O, actually oxygen, O2, but they abbreviated O can oxidize certain alcohols. And in, since I'm not gonna ask you to learn the different ones, an example, potassium permanganate is an oxidizing agent, sodium dichromate is an oxidizing agent, potassium dichromate. I'm not gonna have to ask you to memorize those. I'll just use the general form of this. What happens is there's a hydrogen there and a hydrogen there, and you form a carbon oxygen double bond. And later, about two chapters, I'll teach you this is called an aldehyde. And that's how you make aldehydes. And for my research, for my PhD thesis, I had to make my own aldehydes, and I used this reaction. Dr. White loves aldehydes. You'll find out later. They've been good to me. I've been good to them. So let's take a look at this reaction. Give the organic product or products for the following. So let's look at our starting material. What's different? Ooh, oxygen. Remember, look for what's not a carbon-carbon single bond or what's not carbon or hydrogen atoms. Oxygen with a hydroxyl group and a carbon, but we're oxidizing it. That's what the O bracket, close bracket. So this is a primary alcohol. When you oxidize it, use a hydrogen from the carbon with the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen from the oxygen, and you form a carbon oxygen, double bond, aldehyde. Well, this is my R group. Another way of thinking of it is to break carbon, carbon, single bonds. No. So I have three carbons. The carbon with the hydroxyl group will be the carbon double bond to oxygen. And it's got three bonds, four minus three, hydrogen, And that's how you do it. And I've done that on very large scale in a laboratory where I was making a pound or two. And in a laboratory, that's a large amount. Other reactions I'll talk about in the chemical plant, I've made 180,000 pounds. Not me alone, but I supervised it. Oh, that was fun. All right. 
let's have you try one. Your turn. And don't forget, tonight from 5 to 6.15, I will have my office hour. So if you got any questions, always feel free to come by and ask them. But the only thing you could ask, but I don't have a good answer for it, is what's the meaning of life? <laughs> I haven't figured that one out, and I don't think a lot of people are in, or a lot of people are in the same boat I am back this weekend while you're working on that. My best friend, who's about my age, we've been friends since 1965. Very good friend. Wow, that's a long time. But anyways, I found out Saturday, his wife, his son, and one of his granddaughters came down with COVID-19, asymptomatic, essentially. Thank goodness for that. He hasn't, which is why I didn't see him for the Super Bowl yesterday. Uh, no, I don't need it. And he's uh, quarantined, his wife's quarantined their house, and he's quarantined from her in another part of the house. Life just happens. All right, let's do this. What's different in this molecule? What's not a carbon? What's not hydrogen? Ooh, hydrox group on a carbon, but we're oxidizing it. That's what the bracket O, and this is a primary alcohol. One R group on the carbon with the hydroxyl group. Here's that carbon. And this is my R group. What happens? That stays the test. And you lose a hydrogen, a hydrogen here, form a carbon oxygen double bond. I like writing this down here. When we get into aldehydes, you could write it this way. I just think this way looks way cooler. This is my personal opinion. And Therefore, I have one, two, three, four carbons. And I'm going to end up with four carbons because you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. The carbon with the hydroxyl group becomes this carbon. And I'll teach you the name of that later when we get into that chapter. And I know there are four bonds to carbon. And that's how you do Oh, let's do another one. I'm having fun. And that's my little gift to you, or I'm not asking you to memorize uh, oxidizing reagents. I'll just use the general form bracket, O bracket, close bracket. And it's your turn to have fun. If we were in a classroom, I'd tell you, when you're done, look up and smile. But most of you don't have your webcams on, so I can't do that. Did the chemist guilt work on you? <laughs>
And I think everybody's done, so let's get to work. If I look at a molecule, look for what's different, what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen. Ooh, oxygen with a hydrogen, hydroxyl group and a carbon. When I'm oxidizing it, that's what that bracket, O close bracket means. And that's a primary alcohol. And when you oxidize it, you get an aldehyde. The carbon with the hydrox group becomes this carbon that's double bond to an oxygen. Now, what's my R group? This. That just comes along for a ride. Do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No. So I have one, two, three, four, five across. I better end up with five across. These two carbons have also methyl groups. They come along. And this carbon right here is that carbon and becomes this carbon, which will be double bond to oxygen. And I know there are four bonds to carbon. And there you go. You make that molecule, which I'll teach you later on is an ally. Oh, let's have one more. What would you oxidize start with to make that molecule? Your turn. All right, let's get going. If I look at this molecule that I'm trying to make, what's different? Ooh, an oxygen. Remember, look for what's not a carbon-carbon single bond or a carbon or hydrogen atom. And notice that's double bond oxygen. That carbon has a hydrogen and also carbons. And what do you oxidize to make? And this we'll learn later on an aldehyde, a primary alcohol and a carbon double bond to the oxygen will have a hydroxyl group. What's my R group? Methyl. And if you oxidize this, you will get that. And that's how you do it. All right, let's continue on. Uh-oh, I just lost hang in there. Let's see if I can just get away with using my whiteboard. Or earlier in the class, I'd shut down Word and reopen them, but we're almost done. You oxidize a secondary alcohol 
same thing happens. You lose the hydrogen from the hydroxyl group, the hydrogen from the uh, carbon that has the hydroxyl group, and you form a carbon-oxygen double bond. Now, in an aldehyde, R prime is hydrogen, but this is called a ketone. We'll do a chapter on ketones and aldehydes, and I'll teach you the names of those. So this is what happens when you oxidize a secondary alcohol. Now, I'd like to show you something that organic chemists do, which I do. I can write this molecule this way. Or I can write it this way. These are. Yes, the, yeah. Oh, no. Where did I mess up? I've. All right. Instant replay. Whoever asked told me that. Thank you. All right, let's do this again. Right here, what do we have? Secondary alcohol. You oxidize it. The carbon with the hydroxyl group, you lose that hydrogen and the hydrogen from the hydroxyl group, and you form a carbon oxygen double bond. Now, for an example, these two molecules are the same. Both of those would be two butanol, but I can write them differently. And sometimes I'll do it this way. Sometimes I'll do it this way, or I could put the hydroxyl group on top. And if I oxidize it, general reaction, See what happens when I forget about my thumbs up, people? I mess up. The carbon with the hydroxyl group, you lose hydrogen there, hydrogen from the carbon with the hydroxyl group, and you form a carbon oxygen double bond. Everything else comes along for the ride. So here's my carbon here. I call this R and this R prime, or the other way around. No prime there. Uh oh. I think I just ran out of luck. Yep. Sorry about that. All right, let's finish up. I'm gonna go a whole minute or over. Sorry about that. And therefore we're talking about that. You oxidize it. You break carbon, carbon, single bonds. No, what happens? The carbon with the hydroxyl group becomes a carbon double bond to oxygen and everything else stays the same. And I could have had that oxygen on top also. And if I use this structure, same thing, this carbon and that hydrogen, that hydrogen you form.
this is the two R groups, R and R prime, R prime and R come along for the ride. And these are the same. And this is part of, here I'm showing a bond angle, here I'm not. But they're the same, four carbons, second carbon has carbon double bond to oxygen. And with that, I apologize for going, oh no, I went a whole 60 seconds over. And with that, I'm gonna say, remember, keep your mask on, make sure you're vaccinated, because uh, it's getting dangerous out there, especially with Illinois, along with other states, getting rid of mask requirements. I'm still gonna wear mine for a while. But with that, that's my personal thing. Don't forget, I have my office hour tonight from uh, 5 to 6.15. On Wednesday after class, I'll send out the password so you can take test number one, have it upload by next day. And with that, I'm going to say, gang is on. Goodbye. And Thank found, you. You're welcome. And I found on YouTube, Granny doing that. And maybe Wednesday, I'll have time to show it to you where I stole that.